I wonder how many of you have got solar panels on your roof. Any of you? A few? A few? Not many. How many of you have got solar lights in your garden? A few? Not many. How many of you have got a, a, a solar powered watch? One, two, oh, oh, well, wonderful. Solar power is being harvested. And uh, as part of our celebration this morning, we're thinking about that especially. But let's first think about the sun's effect this summer. For the farmers, generally, there's been too much of it and for too long, and harvests have suffered. And in some parts of the world, of course, drought usually involves too much sun, but not always. It's been said of farmers in this country that many of them are asset rich, but income poor. Their machineries can cost £100,000, but they have to scratch a living and hardly make enough to live off when it's a poor harvest year. But they can't change that. That's how it is. That's how they must live. And so some of them get worried and mental health is a real issue among the farming and growing community in this country. And the church, all churches, are involved in seeking to support farmers who are struggling mentally in this and every other aspect of their work and life. I watched a film, Bridge of Spies, recently. It's about the um, exchange of prisoners between the USA and Russia, oh, many years ago now. Gary Power, who was shot down, a uh, U-2 spy plane, and he was the one who got the news, but the Russian was a man called Rudolf Arbel, a very quiet man. And the lawyer who was working with him and presenting his legal case several times in the film, and I assume it was what happened in reality, kept asking him, aren't you worried? Aren't you worried? about being found guilty and executed, or even if you manage to get back to your own country, of being killed when you get there because the authorities there will assume that you've told the USA all your secrets. And each time he's asked, are you worried? There's a pause. And Abel asks the lawyer, Will it help? Will it help? And of course the lawyer has to say, no, it won't help at all. But that doesn't stop us worrying, does it? We still worry. And the extent that we worry is a measure of some lack of trust in God. On a television program, um, Countryfile, last weekend, a farmer was being in. No, it wasn't Countryfile, it was Songs of Praise. And a farmer was being interviewed, who's a Christian, and he said, Well, I, there's no point in worrying about the situation. I've put everything into God's hands. 
he is my farm manager and I just get on with doing the work but he's the boss and I thought that was really good really helpful but hard to do so we're thinking about the harvest in this country but in some countries it's even more difficult than here so reading from Isaiah chapter 58 verses 1 to 12 shout aloud without restraint lift up your voice like a trumpet declare to my people their transgression to the house of Jacob their sins although they ask for guidance of me day after day and say they delight in knowing my ways as if they were a nation which had acted rightly and had not abandoned the just laws of their God, they ask me for righteous laws and delight in approaching God. Why should we fast if you ignore it? Why mortify ourselves if you pay no heed? In fact, you serve your own interests on your fast day and keep all your men hard at work. Your fasting leads only to wrangling and strife and to lashing out with vicious blows. On such a day, the fast you are keeping is not one that will carry your voice to heaven. Is this the kind of fast that I require, a day of mortification such as this, that a person should bow his head like a bulrush and use sackcloth and ashes for a bed? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Rather, is not this the fast that I require? To loose the fetters of injustice, to untie the knots of the yoke, and to set free those who are oppressed, tearing off every yoke. Is it not sharing your food with the hungry, taking the homeless poor into your house, clothing the naked when you meet them and never evading a duty to your kinsfolk. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and new skin will speedily grow over your wound. Your righteousness will be your vanguard and the glory of the Lord your rearguard. <coughs> then when you, call to the when you call, the Lord will answer. When you cry to him, he will say, here I am. If you cease to pervert justice, to point the accusing finger and lay false charges, if you give of your own food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the wretched, then light will rise for you out of darkness and dusk will be like for you like noonday. The Lord will be your guide continually and will satisfy your needs in the bare desert. He will give you strength of limb. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Buildings long in ruins will be restored by your own kindred, and you will build on ancient foundations. You will be called the rebuilder of broken walls, the restorer of houses in ruins. At this stage in the book of Isaiah, the children of Israel, uh, the Israelites, have been exiled in Babylon, taken from their own promised land, and have now returned to Jerusalem, having supposedly learnt their lessons and therefore been restored by God to the land he had promised them. The land flowing with milk and honey, it says in the early promises of that. 
But it sounds as though they haven't learned their lessons, doesn't it? They're still treating people badly, and especially the poor, the ones without power, the ones who don't have a say in society. And that's really sad, isn't it? Because you would have thought that for a whole nation to be taken away to another country, to become refugees forcefully, they would really look at their lives and ask the question, why has God done this to us or let it happen to us? Surely it must be, and indeed other prophets said so repeatedly and powerfully, uh, you're not living like God said you need to live. And how God wants people to live, not just his own people, but all people. You don't care enough about people in need. And that's what Isaiah is saying yet again to God's people. You fast and uh, uh, fasting and offering the sacrifices required at the temple are the Jews' ways of worshipping. They didn't have services like this as far as we know. But fasting, going without food, and offering the sacrifices was the form of worship in those days. And Isaiah is saying, you're doing these religious things, but you're not doing the practical, everyday things that God requires of you. You're not caring enough for your neighbour. And this is a word to every generation of God's people. Every generation of the world needs to hear this message. Are you doing enough? Are you being sacrificial in what you're doing for those who are in need, both here and around the world? You're doing this, he says to them, in order to curry favour with God and get something extra from God. You think that by being religiously good and obeying the law, God will favour you and answer your prayers. But we know, through Jesus, that God has given us everything he's got to give. And that's his love and his grace and his light and his forgiveness and his power, and his life. He's given everything out of his treasure store already is available. You cannot do anything that will persuade God to give you more than he's already offering you. And not just you, of course, and me, but the world. You cannot do anything except accept. No fasting for favours. No, whatever we do, expecting something back from God, it won't work because there's nothing left in the treasure box. It's all out there. It's all in here for you and for me. A 
God's people in Isaiah's day, we read in elsewhere in Isaiah, are to be the light to the nations, which they failed miserably to be. To be the light to the nations. In other words, to share that message of God's grace and love to the world. And to be so filled with God's love and light as his people now in our own day that your love shines into the world into other people's lives and transforms their situations and indeed our own. You are the light that Jesus came to bring. Every believer has the Jesus light within them and it needs to shine in practical ways, in prayer ways, in loving ways, in worship ways. Let your light shine. What's that song we used to sing as children? Oh, you, you, you remember it, Jean will remember it. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus wants us to be singing that song, if not out loud, um, in our hearts all the time. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Like the sun, except S-O-N, not S-U-N. Like the sun, light to the world. So we are called to let our light shine in whatever way is right for us before God and in our own situations. And one of the ways we can uh, and we do let our light shine is by financially supporting and prayer supporting work that others do in other places and we're going to watch a film shortly when uh, the young people return about a young man called Shanu he's I think he's 18 might be 17 but both his parents have died and he's got two young siblings who he has to look after and provide for and there isn't a big extended family supporting him in doing that and this is one of the projects that we will be looking at. And you are invited to support through the gift envelopes today or to take it away and bring it another week with a gift towards this work. Letting our light shine. The, fast, the last two verses of that Isaiah passage that Liz read, read, uh, read for us talk about when people live justly and with care for others. Life is like a well-watered garden. Well, sometimes we get too much water in the garden, don't we? Just like this summer, we've sat, at times had too much sun. But you get the picture. It's flourishing. It's productive. It's good for everybody. And everybody receives the benefit of that garden. And, and there is a sense in which, in our world today, uh, you could think, and some people do, that the increase, it seems like an increase, in severe weather events and global warming that is threatening prime farmland around the world because of rising sea levels. 
are an indication of humanity's lack of care and thought for people, all people, everywhere. And in Old Testament times, the prophet might say, look, God is punishing you. He is bringing disaster because you are not caring enough for people and for the world. Let it be a well-watered garden that is flourishing where all people can fulfill their lives, their gift from God. You may have seen this. Have you noticed we've got some water at the front? Can you hear it? You see, it came on when you were distracted by the young people going out. This is a solar panel. The water is not being pumped by a solar panel here. That's just an example and a mock-up. But some of you might have water features like this in your gardens. Have you? Anybody got a water feature in your garden? Yes, one. <laughs> Jean would like us to have one, but that's another matter. Because sun and water go together, of course. So, let your light shine. That's the message of this morning. Let your light shine.